So the UBI is a pretty interesting idea. Uh, it stands for Universal Basic Income, and it was popularized by Andrew Yang um, in the last presidential election. And I figure since uh, it's a more popular idea now, um, I believe I've heard politicians invoke it. Um, a lot more pundits uh, in general are invoking it, and I believe it's gaining support in uh, the public at large. And so I'd like to talk about um, the potential downfalls and, uh, let's say, problems with a UBI that I think that gl get glossed over when people talk about it. Um, it's easy to get excited with a new idea that has a lot of uh, potential and feeds into our um, altruistic natures, trying to take care of our fellow man. But that can blind us to a number of different things. I think the first thing I want to start with is that we virtually have a universal basic income already. Only it's not universal. But we cover a great number of people already. Uh, virtually everybody who is um, in need or economically uh, in a compromised position. So let me just run through uh, some of these programs to kind of lay the land for what we have now. And I can contrast that to what a universal basic income uh, might look like. Right now, uh, Social Security is a basic income for people over 65. It pays out monthly uh, checks to everyone that qualify. On average, it pays out 1500 a month. And if you plan it out right and you retire later than um, the earliest uh, available time, you can get up to 3500 a month. I think that's if you retire around the age of 70. Social Security also has uh, some other uh, functions. It pays out benefits to the children of uh, Social, Security, Social Security beneficiaries who die and the, their children are under 18. I think it pays out some disability uh, benefits to certain categories, um, but that covers a decent uh, chunk of the population. Um, we have Medicaid, which uh, pays for health care for the poor. And these other programs, a lot of them aren't cash, but they are um, for goods and services, which are, uh, it's money. You know, it has a monetary value. Uh, Medicare takes care of the old and the disabled. So right now, people over 65 um, get a significant um, monetary uh, benefit from the system we have now. Uh, let's see, food stamps cover the poor. We have unemployment insurance for people who become unemployed. We have um, dozens and dozens of welfare programs for uh, poor people, whether it's cash, whether it's education assistance, training, uh, housing. Um, we have programs for pregnant women, for young kids. Um, I think that covers all of it, but there's um, much more than I can describe in one video, uh, all the programs we have. So I think overall this paints a picture where um, most everybody, or everybody who is not uh, gainfully employed and able to support themselves, they have a wide variety of programs to choose from and benefits to get that will help them in housing, food, um, economic security, whatever you want. And these are things that people say that they want the universal basic income for, except for everyone, including people who can support themselves, which is a interesting twist to it. I'm not sure why uh, people would want to give money to people who can support themselves. Maybe that's a a uh, reflection of the greediness that we all have in our hearts, where uh, we would also like a little cut um, from the federal government. 
let's talk a little bit about Andrew Yang's plan for UBI, since he's the one that popularized it. I think a lot of the um, other people who have proposed uh, universal basic incomes have a plan that's similar to it. But I think since he's kind of the flag bearer for that sort of program, um, we'll just go over his. First of all, he would want to give um, the UBI to people over 18 and $1,000 a month. So uh, UBI, even for him, is perhaps a little bit too grandiose of a term. And I think he realized that a little bit because I think he started calling it the freedom dividend. Uh, so this program is for adult citizens, $1,000 a month. Before we get to the cost a program like that would have over the federal government, let's compare it to a lot of the what I described just earlier about what is currently in existence. And this is important because Andrew Yang uh, would like the, his version of the UBI or his freedom dividend or an idea similar to it to um, be enacted at the same time that all of these other programs and welfare programs that I described earlier are um, removed. Because uh, the cost of UBI is huge, and the current programs we have right now are huge, and there's no way we could do them together, even though most people, I think, would want that to be the case. But I'll talk about that later. So right off the bat, um, if we get rid of Social Security like Andrew Yang and other UBI um, proponents would like, Social Security recipients and the retired would see a cut in the benefits that they... Um, that they enjoy. I've uh, watched a number of interviews with Yang and um, read some of his policy stances, and I don't think he's taken a hard stance on how Social Security would be phased out, if that's a thing that um, current people would stay on, and if we just wouldn't add any new uh, Social Security recipients as we go forward. But I think a lot of people would... Um, feel cheated, and might get kind of angry that um, they would no longer get as much money as the people before them. I mean, it's just a basic human impulse to feel cheated if they don't get as much as the other person. As far as healthcare programs go, uh, depending on how much medical help you need, uh, you are drawing much more than $1,000 a month um, than what a UBI would give you. Um, and maybe that's not you're not incurring $1,000 a month uh, in medical costs currently, but maybe once or twice a year they need a procedure that costs or adds up to more than 12000 a year, and that eats up their, would eat up their UBI right now, where I believe under uh, Medicare and Medicaid, that would all just kind of be covered. I don't know of uh, any ceilings on those, on those programs. Um, and as far as... Uh, the poor and um, the unemployed, um, all of the uh, programs that are out there for sure add up to more than a thousand a month. Our program, our unemployment and uh, welfare programs add up to more than what most jobs will pay. Well, not most jobs. Entry level and, and other jobs. There's a portion of jobs that welfare programs, when you add up all their benefits together, pay more than uh, these positions, disincentivizing work. I'm not trying to judge anybody. I'm not saying the poor are lazy or they're immoral. They follow human um, incentives just as much as anybody else and just as much as I do. And some people will choose to uh, that option over um, working. But either way, Right now, currently, they can draw more than what a UBI would give them. And so if you uh, are speaking to somebody who is more altruistically um, oriented, they might get angry that you would uh, reduce the amount of money that these people um, are getting or are able to get. Which brings me to another point that I wa wanted to make 
is that I don't believe it's politically realistic to enact a UBI and to draw down on these welfare programs. They have too many people in the pocket. Too many people are incentivized to vote for politicians who will give them money. Um, you could say that the political system nowadays has just become a, uh, a circus where the politician that will uh, promise the most things to the most people gets elected. And so we have this just bribery system uh, in place. And while we're not going to collapse into a, you know, universal basic income or a society or a government that'll pay for everything that anybody ever needs, but that's the direction we're heading because we're all incentivized to want more things without you know, working for it, or at least just having to vote a little effort for as much money as the government can give us. So let's talk about Andrew Yang's plan. Um, even though it sounds, uh, let's say, humble or conservative, it would still cost a great deal of money and much more than the welfare programs that we have nowadays, simply just because it's a payment to everyone. And that adds up very quickly. Uh, the U.S. population is 328 million the population of people over 18, which would be available for a plan like this, is uh, 200 million people, a little over that. And if we calculate $1,000 per month for these people, the cost comes out to 3 trillion, 60 billion, 505 million, which uh, is pretty huge especially if you don't track um, the spending or the typical spending of the uh, United States government. You might imagine that that is doable. But to give you context, um, in 2019, the federal government brought in 300, uh, $3 trillion, $460 billion. So that alone, the UBI alone would eat up the vast majority of the money that the United States government brings in um, through taxation without borrowing, without anything else, just through uh, basically stealing our money to pay for things and to uh, pay for the stuff that they promise people. So they brought in $3.46 trillion in 2019, but they spent uh, $4.4 uh, trillion. There's already a built-in budget deficit um, for the United States, and it's been that way for a long time. So any, we would be doubling the federal government spending if we uh, just tack this on without adjusting current welfare spending, which I think would be. Uh, highly incentivized in the current political system we have, like I mentioned before. I made a image showing um, what a UBI would look like if incorporated into the, um, the federal budget. If it replaced, if we just said, hey, we're going to look at what the government spent in 2019, and we're going to force the UBI into it, and we're going to move remove things in order to pay for it. So the slide we're looking at here is the spending in 2019 on each of the uh, federal government programs and uh, various uh, departments. As you can see in the top right, we have revenue for 2019, 3.4 trillion. And if we look at the bottom of the table, the government spent a little over 4 trillion, already over and above what it's able to take in. Actually, I'm being kind of uh, generous with this, with this table because we're gonna go with 
how much they actually spent over what they took in and we're going to plug the UBI into that. So as you can see, on the left side I have the UBI with the cost that I estimated from Andrew Yang's plan, which may be more if uh, the UBI that is depending on the program, it might be more. I think I've seen some people advocate 1500 to 2000 because they feel that it should be a total income replacement. Three trillion. If we just scoop out all of the current welfare spending, that is the bottom uh, four rows of this table, that's obviously not enough. And so I just started working my way up, knocking out um, departments until the UBI was paid for, or at least fit in the spending uh, for 2019. And as you can see, we knock out various agencies, NASA's gone, State Department gone, HUD is gone, Department of Energy gone, and we're only left with Homeland Security, the VA, Education, uh, Health and Human Services, and the Department of Defense. And at this point, no matter what you do, I believe most people will be uncomfortable uh, cutting out various programs to pay for the UBI, or at least people in the government and the people that are getting paid by them. But I think I'm illustrating a point that it, would, it wouldn't be palatable to most anybody. On the right here, I summed up... Um, we could call it welfare spending in the United States, and it's 2.7 trillion. Uh, let's say one of the the pro, uh, pros for having a UBI that I've heard people talk about is that it would streamline uh, welfare or streamline the process of supporting people that need it. We wouldn't need a bureaucracy to administer it. It could be highly automated because since everybody who has uh, was a citizen over 18. You could automatically shoot those checks out to people. But since we have much more people that would be getting these benefits, uh, obviously the cost outstrips any efficiency arguments that, that you can make. Now you can go into saying that, oh, well, this would spur economic activity, this would do this and that. But the, the truth of it is we don't know. I mean, are we arguing that the current welfare system spurs economic growth. And I, that would be hard to, I believe that would be pretty hard to argue because, right, people are getting money that they wouldn't nor normally have, but we're pulling that money out of the economy anyways. At least the money that's taxed. Obviously, a lot of money is being printed out of uh, thin air uh, by the Federal Reserve to pay for um, the spending deficits by the federal government. But we're just putting money into the hands of uh, people and we're getting it from somewhere else. So it's, I think it's, uh, if we want to argue efficiencies of it, we're taking money from people by and large who make things and provide goods and services to people that don't make as many or don't provide as many goods and services and who are not as skilled. So oh, I think overall, you could make a decent argument that we're we're killing efficiency because we're distributing funds and resources to people who do not produce a lot. Um, that is not a moral argument. I'm just making an, an, econo an economic one, and I feel it is also unfair to say that giving these people money, or it's not correct to say that programs of this sort create economic activity. I think that's inaccurate. And if you want to make it the argument to, for these programs, a moral and practical one is probably the best. Practical meaning that we can actually pay for it without going into debt. If UBI were to be enacted, let's say responsibly, or at least in a way that the federal government can pay for, uh, the federal government would have to reduce spending in every area that it operates, especially as we can see um, in defense. It's uh, by, it is among the highest uh, 
cost programs that the federal government engages in. And so the government would fundamentally look very different from it does now. It would almost have to be what a, a libertarian might call a night watchman state. It would have just enough money to do perhaps a little defense, a little policing and managing the courts, and then sending out checks to everybody. That's, that's all it could do under this sort of uh, system, which I don't know if, if you uh, wanted to argue that that was the, the outcome that you would like to see, that you want. You have my sympathies. It would reduce uh, state intervention in the lives of its citizens, and I can get on board with that. And perhaps that would be better than the system that we have now. I think morally, I, I mentioned uh, the moral argument for the for a UBI. And I'd like to maybe just speak on that for a second. I'm not against the idea of a UBI or a freedom dividend or some sort of base um, income for people in need. I think... When we speak morally, though, we have to consider uh, where that money comes from and how it's gathered. I alluded to the federal government stealing from people uh, being taxes or equi uh, equating the two. And I think that's the problem. If you, I think it's immoral to pull, to take money from some people to give the, to others. It doesn't matter if the if it's an altruistic impulse, if it's people are well off that, and it's going to people that are not well off, um, the taking of things by force is wrong. And true charity requires uh, a voluntary uh, aspect to it. And I believe when things are voluntary, uh, the power is balanced. And so if the people receiving the uh, benefits are acting in a way that is betrays the charity, then the people giving the charity can stop. And there's an accountability um, com component to it that I think is really important that the federal government, by its very nature of how it funds itself, is unable to engage in. If the federal government wanted to increase the well-being and, let's say, the economic health of its citizens, it could do, it could start with reducing the harm that it does. And that is included in uh, taxing everything so heavily. That reduces the wages of the citizens that it taxes. It increases the costs of goods and services because everything you buy and sell is taxed. And even in the production process, let's say you're you own a factory, you're buying the components to make a product while each component is being taxed, and then you create the, the product and you sell it out, and then that's taxed. And so there's several levels of uh, price increase just built into the process that the government is artificially uh, creating. The federal government makes it more difficult for people to work. Uh, the minimum wage reduces the amount of people uh, low-skilled workers that can get a job. If I'll probably make a video on this uh, later, but basically, if you're low-skilled and there's a minimum wage that uh, places a price on labor that's too high for you, well, then you can't work and get experience and climb up the ladder. And just practically speaking, if a company has X number of dollars to spend on employees, and then each employee costs more to maintain, well, then they have less employees. And that leads into mandating uh, worker insurance. Uh, companies pay for and or uh, contribute to, uh, why can't I think of the word? Health insurance. That's a cost. So like a, the cost of a worker is not just their salary. It's their salary. It's the... Uh, retirement account matching its health care, its health insurance. Um, it's all sorts of things that are mandated on the employer, which makes 
um, they're able to hire less people and pay people less and it removes a lot of choice in the in the system why is our work why is our health care tied into the place we work and that creates all sorts of perverse perverse incentives perhaps for another another time but uh well i spun off from the morality argument it's immoral to force people to participate in a program or system that they otherwise would not want to if your idea is good if it is economically uh, advantageous if it checks all the boxes well then you should be able to find a voluntary way to pay for it and it should be sustainable over time i believe um, the points that i've given up to now kind of illustrate how difficult a ubi would be and even um, i think a lot of the same problems with the ubi apply to the welfare state as it exists now Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you in the next one. See ya.